All right. Alex, I appreciate you doing this, man. For sure. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, Life in the G. Um, really great read. Uh, very um, engrossing read. And um, as we do our conversation, I told you um, it was very well put together. Um, what was the writing process for this book? Man, um, so I would say I went about it in kind of an unconventional way because when I went to Birmingham actually to report on the team that I followed, uh, I didn't have a book deal yet. So, uh, and this is my first book. So like to be fully transparent, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was kind of winging it. Um, you know, obviously had uh, mentors and people giving me advice, but um, I went about it in an unconventional way just because I, you know, didn't have the deal and I didn't have a timeline or schedule for how things had to be done. So um, the way that I approached it was, um, you know, obviously was hopeful that the story would develop and there would be something compelling enough that eventually, you know, I'd kind of build out this proposal and then be able to get a deal. Uh, so I spent the, you know, six, seven months that I was in Birmingham, just like fully, uh, like focused on reporting. So I did all the interviews. I followed the team. I traveled with them. I, you know, covered everything that they would allow me to cover. Uh, and while I was doing that kind of built out this proposal and then, um, was able to land a book deal during the season. And then when the season was over, uh, I moved from Birmingham back to New York where I'm based and, uh, just focused on writing. And then I had, you know, I think it was, so I got back in, um, April and I turned the book in, in October. So I had that time to kind of focus. I had all this material and then I could just focus on, you know, putting that together and, and actually crafting the book. So that was the process. Yeah. So I know you have a history writing about the NBA. Um, how was it like um, tackling this world, actually, um, the G League? Because I feel like the G League doesn't get its um, credit. I mean, a lot of people have their own um, pros and cons about the G League. Um, you have so many individuals from being um, – former high school stars or college stars and then you know based on the position or maybe the right the time wasn't right for them um when they entered the league and now they're in a position where they have to um battle it out with other individuals who may be in the same situation as them so um how was that environment like um seeing that while you was in Birmingham yeah I mean uh like you said, I, I had experience. I, I worked for Slam Magazine for a long time. I had experience covering the NBA. And I think just first of all, what appealed to me about covering the G League is that, like you said, it just hasn't been covered extensively. Um, even me, like a longtime fan and, and journalist covering the NBA, just knew very little about it uh, and definitely thought I knew more until I was you know, there and, and actually living life in the G League. Uh, so that was kind of what brought me there. I would say that just like my biggest takeaway from actually being there is, you know, it's really an, an inspirational story. I think it's a story that a lot of people can relate to because, um, you know, these are, guys, these are guys who are earning less than 40000 the season that I was following them. Um, and yet they're one step away from that glitz and glamour of the NBA, uh, kind of grinding and facing all of these obstacles to try to get there. Um, and at the end of the day, just pursuing that childhood dream, you know, that dream that every kid who plays basketball has, or, um, you know, in much the same way that any kid, whatever their childhood dream is, they cling to it and they do their best to, to pursue that no matter the obstacles. So, um, I would say that just being there and, and seeing all that goes into it, uh, I was certainly inspired by that pursuit of the NBA. And I hope that people who read the book are, are also inspired. Yeah, definitely. I remember back in the two, early 2000s, probably mid 2000s, there were there was like an ESPN special, uh, ESPN two special, because um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and yeah. um, there was a special on ESPN two called Life in the D, and it followed the um, the local G, um, D League team formerly at that time. It was the Low Country um, Low Gators, right? And um, <laughs> I think they were affiliates of the uh, Miami Heat. Um, Emi Udoka, obviously, you know, uh, current um, head coach of the Houston Rockets. He had played for the team as well. And um, I think it was like a six-week, seven-week um, series. And they just showed a whole ins and out of how the uh, players used to dealt with um, on the court and off the court issues and stuff. So I just feel like um, when I read your book, it just got me back in that mode. And, you know, hearing about players like Jared Harper and Joe Young and Malcolm Hill, who was able to um, – he was able to share in this book and – um why did you um, select those individuals that stand out? Yeah, well, first of all, that that series, it's funny because 
obviously when I start working on the book, there's not really much out there on the G league or the D league. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had heard obviously about this series and, and I admittedly had never come across it. Um, there was no team at that time. I'm from New York, even mm -hmm. in the remote, like anywhere close. Um, and I was trying to track it down and it's like nowhere to be found now. So I, like, I know, right. So it's crazy though. Like to hear people be like, Oh, I remember the series. I'm like, I can't even find it. Like it, on the internet anywhere, like any record of it. So uh, it's always nice to, to talk to somebody who has memories of the D league and, you know, actually some uh, coming at this project with some idea of, you yeah. know, what you're kind of getting into. Um, yeah. I, the process of like picking the players uh, was definitely, you know, I kind of knew going in that I didn't want to focus on the team as a whole. Like I had to really focus on, I ended up picking four um, you know, a few players and, and really kind of dive into their backgrounds, their full journeys. Um, so I went in with an idea of, you know, I obviously knew the roster um, idea of like guys that might have compelling stories, but I didn't want to just like pick before I got to know them and knew their personalities and, you know, was able to just kind of dive a little deeper than what I could find on the internet. So I went down there and the approach was I interviewed everybody. So I, I started by kind of every day after practice, talking to a different player, getting into the background. Um, and then um, as the season goes along, you know, you start to uh, get closer with certain guys, realize the guys who maybe have the best chance to make it. Um, and I think what appealed to me about these four is that they had such unique stories. Jared Harper is kind of the undersized, uh, super talented guard who has always been overlooked because of his height. Uh, Zylan Cheatham is this... Um, you know, incredibly athletic, skilled player who's just gotten unlucky and just keeps getting these terrible breaks. And uh, to me, it's kind of like the quintessential G League story where the guy just can't catch a break and he's doing everything right and working so hard. Um, Joe Young is the player who made it to the NBA, made some mistakes, fell out of the NBA, and then is trying to get back. So it's kind of a like redemption story. And then Malcolm Hill, um, he was just kind of an unknown, obscure prospect playing overseas who uh, was clinging to the stream, but nobody thought that he had a shot to, to kind of make it. And he has this um, very like disciplined approach and kind of a step-by-step -step plan of how he's going to get there uh, and kind of defy the odds. So those four at the end of the day, the fact that they were one, just great guys, great characters and had such different storylines. Um, that was how I eventually, you know, settled on those four. I know you know, early in the conversation, you talked about their salary. Uh, what are some other things um, that the players have to deal with in this league um, to oppose to being in the NBA? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the main one people talk about is flying commercial, which is uh, it, it's it hits different when you're hopping off of, you know, Southwest flight and you got a connection and you're sitting in a middle seat and the next day you're playing in a game that could decide whether or not you go to the NBA and you're six, nine. So it's, it's just a uh, crazy to see these guys, you know, hop off these planes and then play NBA caliber basketball, basically, uh, and be expected to kind of perform at their, their peak, um, you know, having kind of crammed into this tiny seat uh, for however many hours. So that's one, the travel has always been, there, there's horror stories about the travel, long bus rides, um, delays, you know, all that kind of stuff that you deal with that any of us deal with. Um, but at the NBA, obviously these guys fly private, so it's a, a different experience. Uh, you know, I think it's just, it, it's everyday obstacles of like, you, you're dealing with an absurd amount of pressure and stress because it's true that like, you know, one or two bad decisions or mistakes could kind of decide your fate and, uh, dealing with that pressure day to day where you're not only expected to perform on the court, but like do all the right things off the court, you know, don't be out partying. Don't, um, you know, be in the gym early, you know, work extremely hard. Like don't, uh, let any of this stuff kind of off the court influence anybody's perception of you. You're just, uh, it's that feeling like you're always being scouted and you're always being judged and you're always being watched. And I think that that is, um, you know, I don't think it's normally painted as just like an obstacle because it's not very obvious and seen. But when you're there, you realize like just how easy it is to fold when you're in that kind of environment where um, it's cutthroat and you see guys getting opportunities and you're hoping it's you uh, and you're dealing with this pressure day to day to just 
kind of be perfect. So um, yeah, I would say that that was, those were the main things. At the beginning of the book, um, Andre Ingram, he has an uh, forward for the book. Um, how much did he play a big pack factor in this book and how did that um, relationship start it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, having covered basketball was familiar, obviously with Andre's story, just a super inspirational story. And to me, like the G league story, like when people think about the G league, they think Andre Ingram. So that was like, I was like, if I can get him in any capacity to be involved, like that would be a dream for me. So believe it or not, he was still playing in the G league, um, the season that I was there. Uh, and you know, he was kind of this veteran leader on the South Bay Lakers and they came to play in Birmingham and I requested to speak to him after the game and probably talked for 10, 15 minutes. And I just outlined everything I was doing, you know, told him how much uh, his story honestly pushed me and inspired me to, to do the project in the first place. Cause it was stories like his that I wanted to capture. Um, and, you know, anybody who knows Andre uh, knows that he's just the nicest guy ever. And uh, he was totally on board and, you know, we just kind of, kept in touch. And I eventually told him that, you know, I'd be honored if he would write the forward and kind of lead the book with um, hearing from, in, in my mind, Mr. G League. So uh, that was awesome. And, you know, huge shout out to Andre because uh, I don't really think a G League book would be like complete without his voice being in it. So uh, yeah. I was on. Yeah, definitely. Because I think the whole NBA world watched that game when he played against, when they, um, the Lakers played against um, the Houston Rockets, I believe. Yeah, yeah. You know, he just had that shootout, man. It was just like, <laughs> it couldn't it was make, fairy tale. Yeah, it was like a fairy tale. Like everything was lying for up from. It's like just yeah, that because it, you know, it's that pursuit of that dream for so long. And then you get there. And I think for a lot of guys, it's like, you know, it's like you're here, but then the kind of shift it becomes almost more stressful because you're trying to stay there. And I think the book captures that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for Andre to just have, you know, this very brief taste of his dream but for it to be everything he had ever imagined and 10 times more, um, you know, it's just such an incredible story. Um, what are some players that you feel um, that benefited from the G League a lot? What are some, like, names that, like, stand out to you? Man, there's – what's crazy is there's so many now. Um, you know, I think the stat at the beginning of this season was that uh, – half the league or a little over half the league had experience playing in the G league. So, mm -hmm. you know, any of these guys who, whether they're being assigned or they get called up, they benefit from that. Cause you get reps, you play good basketball. Um, you know, for a lot of these guys who aren't in the rotation in the NBA, it's just an opportunity to play. Like it's an opportunity to just like stay in shape. And um, you know, the tempo is, is more similar to the NBA and, you know, just get used to what it's like to play professional basketball um, so, so many guys, uh, the, the big names that have come from the G league, I think in that kind of, um, you know, they had to grind it out and, um, kind of put in the work and, and finally get recognized. And, uh, in a lot of cases, change their games. Those guys are like Alex Caruso, Gabe Vincent, Duncan Robinson, um, Danny green, Christian Wood. Hassan Whiteside was in the G League, uh, Gary Payton II, Seth Curry. Um, you know, it's, it's all the same type of players, I think. It's these role players who buy into these roles. You know, you're not going to get guys coming out and turning into superstars. Um, it, it's guys who are committed to doing all the little things, to playing hard on defense, to um, spacing the floor and knocking down their threes or you know, guys like Jose Alvarado too, who pick up 94 feet and kind of inject like energy. And, um, you know, those are the guys who, who tend to make it and who tend to stick. So those are some of the names that, that stand out. Now there was a league, um, but prior to the G league and D league, um, the continental basketball association, uh, which you shared about in the book, um, if you just mind us, um, talking about that association. Sure. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't cover the other leagues as extensively because, leagues like the CBA, they were just weren't like true minor leagues. You know, they were basically just other pro leagues that, um, you know, they were viewed in a way as pipelines to the NBA, but there was no connection or cohesion between them. Um, so you'd get guys who would not make the NBA go play there, guys who were playing there who might get recognized by the NBA. But, you know, it's just nothing like the model now where you have this one-to-one -one affiliation and teams are constantly sending guys down and calling guys up. And so that was really the, the kind of inspiration to get 
the what was then the D League, the, the G League started was like we need something that's actually like connected and, and intertwined with the NBA so that we can, you know, players have a place to go if they don't make it because there's so many guys who are capable of making it. Um, and, you know, back then you wouldn't make it and then you wouldn't know where to go. I mean, you either go overseas, you know, your agent might steer you in certain directions, but like you wouldn't make it to the NBA and then you're in no man's land. And now it's like, you don't make it to the NBA. If you're right there, you're going to the G league and you're, and you're, you know, in a system that's preparing you to potentially make it to the NBA. Uh, so leagues like the CBA, of course, they were like great leagues. The level of basketball was phenomenal, but it was nothing like the G league and that it just wasn't a true minor league. Uh, so I didn't cover it that much, but certainly a lot of guys who ended up in the D league back then had experience playing in the CBA and had kind of bounced around some of those other pro leagues. Have you heard any drawbacks from like, let's say players who have already have been established and they maybe have to be downsized to the um, G league. Like um, I know there's been stories of um, um, Serge Ibaka. I know he played in the G league for a while. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard anything on that behalf? Yeah, I mean, I would say certainly there's stories of guys who got sent down, didn't like it very much, uh, <laughs> and it kind of messes with your head a little bit. I think that one of the things that they've done a good job of kind of flipping is, you know, it used to be looked at as like a demotion. Like you get sent down, and it's like, you know, you're being punished almost. You're, you're not good enough. Go down there. Now it's looked at as like an opportunity. You're sent down there. Like we, we actually care about you. We're invested in you. We want you to get better. That's why we're sending you down there. Um in terms of like messing with a player's ability, you know, I think that there at times there are G League teams that are like completely disjointed. You know, it's like teams where it's every man for himself and it's selfish basketball. And, um, you know, I think that that's rare now because they do a good job of communicating to these guys that like your best path to the NBA is like buy into a team and play team basketball. But uh, I, I can't think of one like that stands out specifically, but I'm sure there are players who came down and were just exposed to worse basketball because they're just right. playing like, you know, it's like isolation heavy one-on-one -on -one and um, you know, that, that the last thing an NBA team wants is for you to go down and pick up worse habits and then bring it back up thinking like you're the man now. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't think of like a specific player, but there's certainly examples of that. Um, but I think like more often than not guys come down they're already within the system. So they know what they're supposed to do. Right. Like, you know, they have, in a lot of cases, they have a coach that comes down with them. There are coaches that are kind of hybrid coaches between the NBA and G league. And so they're just like, you know, they're brought into the situation where they know exactly what's expected, what to do. Um, and the communications there. And I think it, it was more likely to spiral out of control when none of that stuff existed, which was kind of the early days. Right. You talked a little bit about coaching. Um, well, um, um, viewing this team, how was the coaching like here? Was it like, how were the coaching style? Was it like, okay, we're going to help each player or is it like, is it just all team oriented? Because at the end of the day, we're just yeah. trying to win. It's a great question. Uh, I would say it's a mixture of both for sure, because yeah. I think that the, the number one thing that they communicate is that like your best chance to get called up is to buy into what we're doing as a team and for us to win. So like, it, you know, it'd be a lot tougher if like that wasn't the case, but I, I saw that, like I, I, you know, I actually talked to players and I witnessed that be the case where like teams, the team that I was following when they started winning interest started to go up and people, there were more eyeballs and uh, more phone calls to the, the GM and stuff like that. So um, I think that they, I think every coach in the G league would tell you that their number one goal is to get players to the NBA. And so there's a lot of player development. They're constantly working with these guys individually, but they're also preaching that message that like, if we are all going to make it, that means we all have to buy into this together and play team basketball. Because like, if you know, Joe young or whoever, Jared Harper goes out there and it's just like, it's a one man show not only is that like take away from everybody else on the team, it's not going to be Jared or Joe's ticket to the NBA either. Even if they're playing really well, their best chance is to, to play kind of team oriented, unselfish basketball. And so I think that that, that being the case and that being the message that they preach from day one, um, you know, you're, you're more likely to see a, a buy-in to, to that kind of style. Um, since the book release, um, have there been any uh, updates from any of the players that you highlighted in this book? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, without spoiling too much, I mean, I guess you know it's a, yeah. a good search away, but uh, <laughs> the 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 four guys that I followed kind of all ended up in different places, um, which um, you know it does kind of reveal one how difficult it is to get there, and just two how many different paths there are to to follow. And you know, the big one of the central themes of the book is that decision between going overseas and and playing in the G League and chasing the NBA. Um, and so these guys are kind of scattered all over some overseas, um, Malcolm, who, uh, you know, he had an opportunity in the NBA. He's now back with the squadron. So he's playing in the G league and kind of going through the grind and, and fighting again to make it. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, hopefully the book allows people to see every angle because these guys wind up in different places. And, um, like I said earlier, have totally different journeys. So, um, that's kind of what it's like for a, a player on the fringe. Um, the president right now, I believe it's uh, Sharif Abdul Rahim. Yeah. Um, have you able to um, reach out to him and have a conversation with him? And um, what are like the future plans for the G League? For sure, we uh, we've talked a bunch, especially since the book came out. Uh, they've been super supportive, and you know, I think the G League is any coverage of the G League. They're like, we need to get the word out about. Uh, one, just like what's going on in this league and the level of talent in this league. So uh, they've been super supportive and Sharif is a great dude. Um, and we've, we've talked a bunch um, in terms of plans, like for the future, I think it's just, you know, they're, they're now at that one-to-one -one affiliation model, which was the long time goal was we need a G league team for every NBA team. And then we have a true minor league. Um, I think the number one thing that, that, you know, I don't want to speak for the G league, but I would assume that kind of the number one thing they're focusing on is just like more exposure. Like let, let's, Let's get people in seats. Let's get people to care about the G League. Let's get people invested in watching these players and following these stories because, um, you know, to me, it's like it's a story like a last chance you or like a hoop dreams. And, you know, people love those stories about people pursuing their dreams. And yet the G League struggled a lot to get people to, you know, to care about that level and uh, to watch those games. And, you know, it's always kind of surprised me because like people love college basketball and this is, certainly like like several levels higher if you watch the g league and then watch a college basketball game you'll be shocked at just like how different levels they are and and you know how good that brand of basketball is and yet they're kind of struggling to get uh people to watch those guys who were once college stars and you once rooted for at auburn or oregon or arizona state or illinois where those four guys went um and so i would assume that their kind of focus is all right now we've actually built this minor league we have this um, system that's working and for the NBA teams. Now, how do we get more people to, to actually care about it and to watch it? Yeah. Cause I remember a few years ago when Boogie Cousins was playing for the Warriors, I believe he had an assignment um, for the Santa uh, Cruz Warriors. And um, he said, mad props to those guys in that league, in the league. Like he gave right. you respect. Yeah. So no, that, that's him, a, right. That would be huge. Like, I think that that I've talked to people around just cover who covered the G league about, how much that would do for the G league. If those guys started coming down and actually playing, you know, you, you get guys now like stars who get sent down to like rehab. You know, I remember CJ McCollum, like a couple, like I want to say a month ago, he practiced with the squadron in Birmingham uh, sent down by the Pelicans, but he just practiced to kind of rehab. If those guys start playing in the G league, like imagine CJ McCollum playing, and then you can go watch him play in like a tiny gym for $20, you know, that, that's going to get people to go for yeah. sure. Um, so obviously that the kind of star power and you're seeing that a little bit with ignite and with like all the rookies, um, you know, not all of them, but, uh, a lot of the lottery picks and first round picks coming down and playing in the G league. Those are guys who are big names. Um, you know, I know, I know the Thompson twins, I think both have played in the G league this year. Um, obviously both top 10 picks. Um, the more of that, the more they can kind of sell star power because that's, that's a, a hard thing to do in the G league. Uh, that certainly helps as well. Yeah. I, you brought up the Ignite. Um, how was that process like, you know, creating that um, team and, um, you know, them, you know, them including them in that uh, league? Yeah. It's interesting because like um, it, one of the questions I get a lot is like, why didn't you focus on Ignite? Because Ignite is the biggest draw for the G League. So that's in that sense, it's great. It's great for the players. It's another opportunity to, um, you know, another pathway to get to the NBA and earn, you know, money for, 
a year or two before you inevitably get drafted for a guy like Scoot Henderson or, um, you know, Jalen Green, uh, Kuminga, these guys came through Ignite. So it's great for the players, but the experience is very different. It's not like um, the true G League, I would say, in that these guys kind of play, a, uh, at least the season I was there, they played almost like a showcase schedule. They didn't play a full schedule. Um, and, you know, the big difference being that guys at that low, uh, guys on that team are making, they, they sign huge contracts. Uh, and the standard G League contract is, like I said, 40K. So um, the experience is a little bit different, but um, you're still playing against G League competition. And on the whole, it's great because uh, these guys get an opportunity to grow before they get to the NBA. They get to play way tougher competition than they would in college. Um, and it gets more eyeballs on the G League. So I think bringing it in was kind of a no brainer. And um, from what I've seen and from you know what I've gathered, just talking to people around the G League, it's been a, a huge success, not only in preparing players for the NBA, but in like, uh, building the exposure and the brand of the G League a little bit. I, I think you play a big part, Alex, um, especially writing a book like this. I feel like this is very needed. Um, this is a book that I feel like that was long overdue. Um, you getting co-signs from individuals like Jeff Perlman and um, Jake Fisher, guys I've um, partnered up and worked on things with um, with them before. And um, so um, you go, you have my co-sign, definitely. Thank you, man. Life in the G. Um, Alex, tell them where they can find you from. Find you from. You can find me on uh, Twitter. It's Alex underscore squadron. Um, and yeah, the book is Amazon, Barnes and Noble, my publisher's University of Nebraska Press. And yeah, just want to say thank you so much for, for reading it and for your kind words about it. Uh, and yeah, for just like taking the time to not only read it, but talk to me about it. Cause um, I agree, man. I, I, the, the goal was to highlight these stories and these types of stories. And uh, the more that we can kind of spread the word about um what basketball is like at that level and what that pursuit looks like. Uh, that's the goal. So I appreciate it.